we hope um, this is okay with you. We've got an hour, a little bit longer, and the idea then is to, to chat, to conversar with Luis and Alaina. Um, and the conversation will, we will be participating with Jimena, who is a, a young colleague who <clears throat> has been participating in all this. And I'm Claudia. Um, okay. I, and I won't be doing all the talking, but just to get sorted out. Is the, the first thing I wanted to say is that uh, thank you so much for, for, for saying yes to this because uh, we were afraid you, you might not uh, <laughs> say yes. Oh, <laughs> no. You I, might I, say yes. I want to go to Mexico, so of course I'm going to yes, say yes. yes. <laughs> we, we've got great plans. Um, yes, ideally this was part of a larger project, but because of all this, it ended up being much more reduced online. But if we feel it works, the, this plan of um, putting translation in, in conversation with poets and translators so that the translation doesn't circulate in a void and misses out on a lot of uh, interest and potential because it's two, two languages, two positions, two cultures coming into contact and yeah. it's not easy and there are difficulties and there are things that don't match. And this is a bit of what we wanted to do and also because in Mexico, it's a very different story. Uh, most uh, indigenous poets do their own translations uh, they, they, and they write thinking bilingually, but it's a different story altogether. So- I um, can't accept right now, Donna, I'm on Zoom. Let's um, okay, see talk to you later. if we can- get going with this uh, uh, new type of dialogue of conversation. Um, I'm not going to introduce Louise because we are preparing a more formal introduction that we're going to stick on to the edited version. And because, I mean, we've got so much to say about you, it would take up practically all our time. So if you don't mind, Luis, what, what I would like to say is that we consider you una amiga de la UNAM y de México. A friend, you've always said yes, you've participated in the, uh, ele the E anthology Meridiano, you've also um, participated in an anthology we prepared years ago on uh, women writers from Canada. So yes, you always say yes. So we are deeply grateful and hope to keep this friendship uh, on. Um, Alaina, very, very briefly, is uh, um, Louise's publisher from Brick Books, which is a tremendously interesting um, uh, publishing house. In, in a minute, we'll ask Alaina to say a little more. The uh, text that comes on the page of Brick Books is splendid. I hope uh, publishing houses in Mexico take note. Um, and also because you are a link, a, a fundamental link in this chain we're trying to establish, not poetry in the void, not translation in the void. If it's not published, if it doesn't circulate, if it's not taught, uh, then a lot of this gets lost. Okay, so muchas gracias, thank you. And um, perhaps now Jimena would like to start off uh, talking about your last book briefly, Jimena. 
Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. I'm really honored to have this moment, this conversation with all of you. And I think that to start us off, we can talk a little bit about the book itself. So we can just like bounce off ideas about how you first started to think about the project. What was your idea behind it? How it came to be? If you could talk a little bit about that and maybe give like the brief uh, summary of, that you are used to giving on this sort of tour that you're having with the book. I think that'd be nice. Are, are you referring to the recent book, Oasis? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's <laughs> great. Um, this book came about, uh, I'm always looking for different topics. And I, I, so what I started asking people in my community, uh, both um, white people and Native people, what was the funniest thing that ever happened to you? <laughs> okay. And... Um, uh, so they gave me their stories and I, and I, and I, I asked them, can I write this story? And I said, it won't, I won't name you because some people are embarrassed by their stories. I won't name you. Um, but I'll build a character around it. So, uh, they agreed to it. And what I did was after I, I built, uh, the book was published, I gave everybody a copy of that book. So they have their stories and, um, uh, and the character Oasis actually means little child. But the other meaning and the true meaning of it is we are all alone. We are all alone, this spirit. And so Oasis in this particular text is a trickster. And she's an adult child within because we all carry that little child within. I mean, we get hurt and usually it's a little child that's hurt. And, um, but a lot of people don't like to share the funny things that happened to them. And so they would privately tell me their stories. And so I, I, I built this character as if it was part of uh, it. And I believe actually it is. It's a, um, a legend figure of all of us, uh, a relative to Wisagaja, uh, uh, which is our mystical uh, trickster in our community. So that's how the book came to be. And I, I'm doing a lot of Zoom work more than um, in-person stuff for promotion. Um, my only travel recently has been to Germany with the uh, our Governor General of Canada, uh, and it was a state visit to Germany, but um, it wasn't, it, it didn't involve my own work. It was just because I'm representative of the uh, poets across Canada. And uh, so that's how that, text came to be thank you for asking it was a fun text <laughs> it is a fun text I, I i think that because i've read a lot of your previous work which is more like raw and and very uh close to heart and this mm -hmm. one is more like let's enjoy let's enjoy mm -hmm. language let's enjoy life let's enjoy those experiences that sort of make you feel awkward and uncomfortable, but they're also like part of who we are, right? Like yes. enjoying and being able to laugh at ourselves and make fun of those moments that are usually not like taught, talked about or wanting to be considered as part of being like with you and part of you, right? So yeah. I think that's it's so interesting to to just go into this this new introduction to to the trickster and to to those like sort of um histories and stories about people so yeah. I, I would also like to talk about a little bit of how that process of writing but then of turning into it into a book that was going to be published and was going to get to a wider audience um how did you feel about it how how was that experience of like turning the story into a book and then into something to be uh, shared? Um, I, I've got two thoughts here. Actually, I have three thoughts. One is that um, uh, I, I need to highlight the fact that in my community and in my language, we don't have um, 
gender pronouns. Uh, when we talk amongst ourselves, a, a guy can be a she or a he at the same time in one sentence, and a woman can be a he and she in one sentence. So we don't have specific gender at all in my language. So when I was writing the book, I, 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 I attempted to include all of that in one poem, and I got confused by myself because I've, I've gotten <laughs> used to speaking, you know, speaking English with the proper pronouns. Um, but, you know, a lot of people uh, write the salutations at the end, I, I'm a she, 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 her, whatever. And I'm going, you know what, that doesn't matter in my language. What matters is that uh, in, in, in my, uh, for being human, it's, it, it's, it's, we just say, say, I'm Inu. And Inu means being, a state of being, mindfulness. And so I, I, I don't know how to include that in my uh, salutation, but if I was doing a salutation, I would just write state of being, mindfulness with my pre-word. Um, the other is, it, it would be such a fun anthology if we gathered all of us here and show, show, uh, wrote our moments of embarrassment as an anthology, <laughs> wouldn't that be fun? An international laughter <laughs> book. Yeah, uh, yeah, that would be so much fun. Now, the, uh, um, I never thought, uh, you know, I never, know, I never know if my books are going to be accepted for publication. I just sent them out, and uh, so far, so good. I haven't had any rejects. <laughs> Mostly invitations to uh, invitations for my work. And um, I think there's a real curiosity in, in across Canada and in, around the world about Indigenous writing. And what I'm finding is that here in Saskatchewan, in the province where I am, mm -hmm. is that our festivals, our Indigenous festivals, are very, very seldom visited by mainstream public. Mm -hmm. And I think I asked a friend of mine who comes to our festivals, I said, what's up with that? How come white people don't come to uh, our, our readings? Like, what's up with that? Like, they want our work and they're curious about us, but they don't make that effort to join us. And so I, recently I've been experiencing a lot of anger and uh, about that and a lot of anger towards uh, mainstream writers because they don't understand that white privilege plays into their work, yeah. okay? And um, uh, and I've said that to them, uh, you know, because of their command of English and because of their historical uh, travels in their language, they have what is perceived as superior content of words and languages. Whereas we're, and I want to point them to Aboriginal writers and go study this word understand the difference between your right privilege and our attempt to master English. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And uh, so um, anyway, that, that's what I'm struggling with right now is, okay, I've been collecting a lot of Aboriginal writers from various uh, tribal communities and studying their work and going, there's such a difference of, of, um, of how we approach story and how uh, we write the poetry and uh, the the uh, exchange of languages, so it's it's fascinating to me. And uh, of course, I've got to deal with my own anger because I get I get like irate about it, you know. <laughs> so, and I try to be healthy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But we'll some things don't change without a bit of anger, no? We see this in Mexico. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. I think there needs to be like that balance of anger and just like finding a way to channel that anger to, mm -hmm. to productive ways of in intervening and engaging. Yeah. And I think that what you've mentioned about like that position of privilege, I think is so important to point out because we have that 
we're we're from English literature in Mexico. So that's sort of like a very particular way of looking at English literature. But then we think about the authors that were meant to know and to study and to write about, which are always like British, um, you know, like from way, way back when. And white British yeah. <laughs> males. Yeah, yeah, the old yeah. story. The old so, story. Yeah. yeah, well, they're all dead. <laughs> they're all <laughs> dead. Uh, exactly. <laughs> And they're, you know, I mean, they, it's, it's like they haven't evolved to the present day literature. Yeah. And I mean, when I was in university, that's all we studied was Shakespeare. And, um, and I'm going, okay, and until actually one professor was kind enough to show me that in Shakespeare's stories, there are some similarities with native culture, but I didn't really get the total uh, gist of it. And um yeah, so I mean, I didn't really study. Well, I I took one class of poetry and I hated it because I didn't understand the lingo. I mean, I went to residential school. I come from second rate education, and um, so I've never I've never mastered those things. And I almost failed the bad poetry class. And I think just out of the goodness of his heart, he passed me. But mm. you know. Uh, yeah. But I had no interest in, in, in knowing what, uh, and I still don't have any interest in knowing what, you know, those fancy words around poetry and dictation and all that, because I think it'll rob me of my voice. Mm -hmm. And I don't want my voice to be robbed or controlled, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll, I'll no. do that for me. Thank you very much. So, yeah. Which brings us back, sorry, Jimena, but just, to, yeah. yeah, how careful we have to be when trying to get your voice to travel, no? Mm -hmm. To other languages, other countries. Uh, but it's important because, again, and we've seen this in our courses, how uh, your writing has proved to be much more meaningful to many of our students than a lot of mainstream British writers, which again, I mean, not that we should not read them, but at least we need more dialogue, more contact. And the more we read you, the more we realize how careful we have to be about stereotypes. No? This you were saying about uh, laughter, embarrassment, you were talking with Jimena, but also anger, no? Also mm -hmm. uh, history, um, experience, how all that counts, uh, no? It's, it's not a simple story. It's an important story, uh, but it's got different uh, sides to it, no? And, and here I was just wondering, Jimena, would it be okay if we just ask, we were wondering also, before we go on to the translation of the poem itself, but we were just wondering if we could ask Elena about the publishing bit, because again, uh, and this would be of interest here in Mexico, wh what happens when uh, one publishes uh, Louise's work, um, does that uh, imply changing some rules and some strategies in the publishing world? Or on the contrary, does Louise's work finally have to fit into the older system? Could, could you just tell us a little about this, if that's okay with Louise? I'd be happy yeah. to, to speak from it about it from my perspective and Louise, you can add your own. Um, but uh, I, Louise and I worked uh, very closely. Um, we spent, I think one day it was about four or five hours on the phone uh, going through um, line by line, uh, just making sure that I wasn't imposing um uh, those kinds of uh, English rules on um, deliberately transgressive and um, w ways of using language that Louise has. So just uh, a lot of 
slow, careful care. I think we had to go through. Um, and we also hired um, uh, some uh, two people, uh, Eric and Jean, um, who are uh, Cree editors to edit the Cree language uh, portions of the book um, and make sure that there was, uh, you know, accuracy there. Um, and I was just going to say, I, I love that conversation about, um, you know, the, the, the anger and the reclaiming of, of language and the making sure that Louise, your voice doesn't get lost. And I think there's some incredible examples of that in this book, you know, when some of my favorite moments are when the English language gets deconstructed a little bit, you know, um, in this very sassy, um, kind of uh, way that's really resisting but with joy um, and play um, at the same time as there's an anger behind it and I feel like the character of Oasis and this book called Oasis contains so many different things at the same time um, you know the anger the joy the laughter the resistance the um, embarrassment all all of those things at once and um I feel really proud to be publishing it because I feel like we can get focused on just publishing works around ind Indigenous trauma. And I think it's really, really important to make space for works of Indigenous joy at the same time. Um, so I'm very, very proud uh, to be publishing this. Book. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Because the publisher's voice many times never figures, I mean, in this sort of is the chat or conference or whatever. And I think it's very important that, I mean, finally, it's um, a whole group w w working on this, no? Is the, w Louise, w would you like to, to add anything to what is the, Elena has just said? Um, uh, working with, uh, because I don't write Cree, I speak it, but I, I, I have a hard time even reading it when it's in text. But um, um, Jean and uh, Eric, her husband, are really wonderful to work with. And I spent hours with them dissecting uh, my language and making sure that uh, we have the right translation. Um, if you look on the parliamentary website, you will see all of the uh, all of the recent poems that I've done um, nationally, and um, uh, they are translated into English and French and Cree, and, uh, and occasionally Inuit. And um, uh, I work um, very extensively with Eric and Jean to try to get the right, um, Ina, what's the word? Enons? <laughs> <laughs> ah, something like Is that. Is that the yes. right word? <laughs> uh, <laughs> around, ar ar around the poem. So um, it, it, it's, it's hard. It's, um, it, translation is difficult. But I think even if we were working in Spanish, what we would need to do is um, maybe exchange uh, the meaning of one word to say, okay, uh, what is it? What is the true meaning of that? word in your language like how, how do you get to the grassroots the level of it and it, it that's what i do with my language and then we can we can marry them somehow yeah. exactly I, exactly e even if we go slow <laughs> no um yes perhaps elena uh, just to mention how um the fragment we translated, and now in, in a minute we'll be coming to that, but it took us quite some time. Uh, we did it with, with, not with embarrassment, but with difficulty and joy. Uh, and it's in process, perhaps after today we say, Chin, we've got to fix this and that and the other. But the, uh, yes, the idea is, uh, perhaps not rush through a book, a, a sort of, a, 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 as they say in Mexico, against the clock, but do something that, that really uh, can open up uh, to the reading of, of that, no? 
Um, okay. Uh, talking about this of Luis and language and Cree, Jimena, I think, has the <laughs> next question yeah. before we come to the translation itself. Yes, I think we're still okay with time. So, yes, adelante, Jimena. So, this is going to be a story about me that I think I want to connect to kind of what you were saying about um, knowing Cree but not knowing how to write it and having that sort of double experience of English and Cree and living in, in Canada. So I did my master's at the University of Alberta and I was there for like two years. And I think one of the kind of difficulties for me was that I, I know English, right? Like I've, I've studied and I've learned and I, I kind of can communicate, but there's still that kind of modern tongue that, that, that is still part of me and part of how I connect and how I, I talk in the world and I act in the world. So that was always like kind of difficult to, to sort of work in those two, two worlds. Right. I wanted to like kind of talk a little bit about that, how living kind of in translation almost all the time sort of makes you think about Canada and, and, other places you might have visited, I don't know. What I do across my travels all over the world and uh, in my community here in Canada is when I introduce myself, I make a point in speaking my language first, always. And that's in, in this country. And that's to just affirm to all the rest of the public, Native people were here first. And this is the first languages because English and French, they claim they are the first languages in this country. Mm -hmm. And I say, uh-uh, no, 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 we don't do that. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, you're going to honor us too. And uh, so that's why I, I make a point to speak in my language first before I, I speak uh, and honor their English ears, you know. And uh, so we need to make room for each other in spite of the fact that we have our own native tongue, Um so that we can dialogue and understand and, and, and do some repair work. I'm not saying to dim, 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 diminish anybody's um, cultural or, or, or historical heritage, but we need to somehow um, um, make room, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. And um, yeah, for sure. I don't know mm -hmm. if that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, I was, yeah, because I feel like most of the time in events in Canada, they have that moment of recognition. And I think that that's part of what I think we don't have here. And that we, with Claudia and other scholars and other colleagues, that we're trying to do that effort of recognizing that we're, we're not like the first and we're not like Spanish is not the first language. And, and sort of that, I think that my being in Canada helped that sort of mirror coming back to Mexico and being like, oh, there's so much that needs to be done to, to have those spaces, like to, to start conversations, to start talking about language and the way that language has shaped and continues to shape how we understand and other ways of understanding the world that we're not or we haven't allowed in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and here perhaps I'd simply add to what Jimena has been saying. How in, I mean, in Mexico, not because things have to be copied necessarily, but it's always very healthy to, to see how things happen elsewhere. In Mexico, it's been very, very difficult to um, get people to understand that uh, most uh, poetry today written in Canada by indigenous poets is written in English. It's, it, it's, it, in fact, for Mexico, that could practically uh, cancel out the possibility of it being indigenous. 
uh, we've uh, talked and discussed and explained this. And in our translations increasingly, and now I look back at some of my early translations, I feel they were terribly simple and um, uh, superficial. Uh, but how understanding a number of issues, this of uh, breaking up stereotypes, the questions related to gender, um, issues uh, for, for humor, for example, the uh, presence of story in, in, in a, a, a much deeper sense are things that we are trying now to underline in our translations because we feel that this will help make space for a, a more complete uh, reception and understanding of uh, Louise's poetry and the poetry of many other poets in, in Canada fighting for recognition, uh, reparation, etc. No? Um, and perhaps what we could do now then is simply come to the poem itself, which is the, the opening poem of Awasis, of the book, and uh, just tell you about some of the things we, we tried to do, uh, some of the decisions we took, and um, the, shed a bit more light on, on all this, uh, on our project, no? Can you see the translation? Is this, yes, that's yeah. really exciting. You'll have to teach me uh, Spanish. Yeah, uh, of course. <laughs> yeah. One of the, uh, may, maybe just to mention quickly, uh, one of the things uh, the public in Mexico need to understand, like we have many tribal groups here, like in my language, which is Cree, there's about four or five different dialects. There's five different dialects of Cree depending what part of uh, province or Canada you're from. So, and then there's other language, there's uh, Dene, which is totally different from mine. It's like Mexico or like um, um, French, and, French and English. It's like, they're totally different um, mm -hmm. language groups. And so, because we have a lot of tribes, it's so it becomes necessary to write in English in, instead of just Cree like mm -hmm. uh, to, to um, make available that story. So that's, that's why English becomes a, a dominant um, feature in our language, in, in poetry uh, uh, across the different tribes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But this looks really exciting. <laughs> it was very exciting to work on the translation because as uh, Claudia mentioned we were having difficulties with uh, not only gender but the cer certain words that can be used in English like um, short tail octopus <laughs> which is something that can be done in in English but I feel is harder to do in Spanish so we we're trying to to play around with words, which was also kind of a joy itself. Like yeah, yeah. How to say something that that is not quite as 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 direct as transparent. Yeah. And what what I add here is that normally a sort of more politically correct translation here in Mexico tries not to translate proper names or names of well, yes, people and places. The idea is that should be left as it, as it comes. But in this case, because there was a, a touch of, of humor, of, of nonsense, perhaps, of the absurd almost, we thought we could uh, pl play with this because there were other moments where the, um, where the humor was lost. This about the otter brother that sounded a bit like the other brother uh, we, we didn't manage to save but we did play with the names 
and uh, Comadrejo, which is the um, oh the the um, weasel in English, the weasel. weasel. Yeah. yeah. In Spanish, uh, it's always feminine, but here we turned it into Spanish because the two brothers are male in this case. So we uh, talked about mi hermano comadrejo, which in itself is a bit ridiculous in Spanish. <laughs> and we thought people might laugh a little, no? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And the octopus was, was fine. This is the pulpo. That caused a lot of, uh, the, uh, made people smile or laugh in Spanish. Yeah, and uh, I wanted to go back to the title, which the storyteller for for us in Mexico doesn't really translate. We don't have that figure as such. We have a narrator, which is kind of the closest thing, narrador. And we decided to turn to Cuenta Cuentos, which is a literal translation of storyteller, but that we in Spanish tend to think of as someone who tells stories to children. Yeah. So we wanted to just like keep that sort of childlike um, figure of someone who's in charge of the story in that way and mm -hmm. without a gender. Sure, so, that's uh -huh. how that works. Yeah. So that's not like, like El yeah. Cuenta Cuentos. Uh -huh. okay. Yes, we, we, we don't know how you might feel about this, but we, we got the impression that the storyteller all along the book is not specifically gender marked in, in one direction. So th we did this in Spanish again. It's taking a certain amount of liberties they, because supposedly one should use the gendered article, but we <laughs> didn't. We were, we were disobedient and we, we didn't. And just before we go on, this of the flaco comadrejo and pulpo con la corta, I don't know if Julia Constantino, one of our colleagues is still, because she had class, but this was her idea and uh, we thank her. The idea is that most of our production uh, owes a lot to a lot of other colleagues and um, helpers. Yeah. Okay. ¿Qué más, Jimena? I think that most of like the joy and the 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 effort of translating was the use of gender mm -hmm. and how. I think it's just so common in Spanish to think in this binary of he, she, that it was such a joy to try to, to play with the language and see how far we could push it and still be kind of understood in Mexico and understood within the context of like the binaries, but still playing with, with that uh, he, she, um, being uncertain as to First, who, yeah, the gender of of the of the storyteller, the gender of Awasis, and and we were just like um, finding the right words to express that 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 both and neither, right? Yeah. And and one of the things that I'm particularly proud of, but I think that we with that addition of child was criatura, which is creature. I think that in Spanish, we use criatura for, for very like nurturing and like, um, but, but not entirely, not, not just human, but like from, from nature. And I think that that was that addition to, to the text that I think makes it as well, like playing with gender and playing with, the sense of the human separated from from the from nature, which I think is very common to find in the language as well in, in Spanish. And also our first natural choice for child would have been niño, which is finally masculine, no? 
and we decided no no way we're going to use nino and the feminine nina was sort of we were still stuck in the same boat so i think it was jimena's idea she came up with criatura which we thought solved things and made this extra connection and then I think that even now we're we're having difficulty with how to address people in Spanish. So we use he, she, or ellas with an e, which is supposed to be more 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 neutral, more inclusive, or with an x. So we were kind of like trying to bring the questioning of language, and then also making sure that that it was still present in a way, even though we didn't include the ella or a with an X, we wanted to maintain the he, she, he, she, he, she. So, so when people read it, it was not as weird or as like uncommon, but still touched fibers. Like who's talking? Like, yeah. I don't know what else. Yes, and, and at the end of the fragment, we come back to El Oeja. We, we respected this gender issue as much as, as we could. Um, and at the very beginning, when it's the ugly one, again, we used uh, the neuter, lo mas feo, which, uh, though it ends with an O is not uh, necessarily masculine. It's the, what, is, uh, what is the most, uh, the, the most ugliest thing of all, which doesn't take the, the gender mark, no? Um, perhaps, Jimena, we could go to the settler mm, uh, yeah. word and then, one other thing I've just thought about, perhaps a settler. Yeah, so again, we don't have a word for settler as such, because I, I know that settler is is a very, uh, has a lot of meaning that, that cannot be just translated as colonizer. But the closest thing I think in Spanish is colonizer. So we use colonizador to kind of connect both like the, the figure of settler with the, the Spanish colonizers here. Uh, okay. so, so, so that, yeah. What about a uh, visitor? Mm. I don't know if that would uh, meet the needs of the settler because sometimes, so in, in my community, we either call them visitors or our brothers or sisters from away or uh, our cousins mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but Perha yeah but perhaps we we overread um perhaps because colonizador definitely has a more violent connotation no it's this idea of the conquista the, the conquest of mexico um we 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 read it perhaps more strongly uh, though perhaps once again in, in the poem, the, the idea is um, not to make such violent, I mean, to see the different groups, but not read them uh, in, in sort of separated so violently as the word colonizador might do. Um, your word for visitante or... Um, I don't know if any of our other colleagues could think of uh, something uh, to, because again, this is a historical difference, no? How the arrival of the Europeans has been uh, named and uh, told and digested. Uh, is probably not exactly the same in, in for, for Canada and for Mexico. No, there, there's also a cultural difference. Um, I think you know what. 
I haven't heard you say that. I think I would stay with uh, the, the colonizer that you have there. Um, uh, just because it does, like, when, when they came to Canada after our my people helped them settle here, it then they turned around and uh, the destruction occurred, right? So I, I and mean, for that reason, we do have a lot of commonalities with the Mexican people. So, uh, you know, uh, I would leave it then, like with the colonizer, for sure. Yeah, uh, I don't have a problem mm -hmm. with that. Okay, but it's interesting. Yes, no, that, that the different words that at least have made us think a bit more. No. Um, and one last point regarding the poem that uh, we also paid a lot of attention to was the presence of sp who speaks and to whom, the whole uh, question of uh, word exchange, no? the, 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 the importance of, uh, of, of talking backwards and forwards. Uh, and again, the idea that at first the, the poem sort of addresses, according to uh, us, uh, the audience at large, and then perhaps Awasis in specific. I don't know if we got it right, this idea of uh, at, at first the you decide, uh, uh, at the very beginning, we have, uh, yes, my, my brother Skinny Weezer, uh, but you decide. There we felt it was, okay, all of you listening to the storyteller. Uh, whereas further on, um, we, uh, the, the you can't decide we felt it was, we didn't say all of you, the, the public at large, uh, we thought it was Awasis who, who's the shapeshifter that can't quite decide at times whether uh, he, she, it is an animal or a human, a he or a she. But um, I don't know. I, I do hope this was where you were trying to, go yeah yeah you've got that right because a was is the one is the one who can't decide you know, you've got that right absolutely and of course it it, it confuses the settler <laughs> yeah like, yes yeah, makes him think <laughs> <laughs> too bad so sad but this is the story you know? <laughs> uh, yes yes exactly the, the story is in charge you've got to one has to do one's homework no is the and and this of the voices of course made us once again pay attention or try to insist upon the the importance of a uh, not this sort of stereotype idea of uh, uh, the old oral tradition but the idea that the, the human voices in conversation are precious and have to the, the conversation has to carry on and we have to talk and to listen to each other um, and it was here where we were wondering if we could then ask you a state Louise if, if you could um, perhaps to, to start closing up the session I don't know if anyone has any uh, question regarding the translation or the poem for, for Louise and, and then perhaps we could start tying up the session listening to Louise read the poem which would be uh, oy, great for us all a moment of joy <laughs> um, bueno, Jimena would you like to add anything or this theme mm, I just found this session to be so interesting and enjoyable because I feel like part of translation is sometimes 
sometimes happens among two people or maybe just by yourself. So this sharing of what we did and and what you thought about it and how you came to think about uh your book and 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 the whole context i think it just enriched how i was thinking about the translation and and the work so so thank you for for being here and for listening <laughs> to to us as well um and in, just uh, in my community um although i'm working with two translators with eric and jean the, the uh, couple It, there's actually a movement right across this province of, of um, a lot of Cree speakers exchanging one word and translating it. And the other really neat movement that is going on is we make up words for English that we don't have a word for in our language. So we explore the other possibility of well, how, well, how does this work in our language and it's so much fun so there's an evolution of language and thought for sure and Luis do you do you keep a note of all because years ago we we studied in our courses tra literary translation and we were forbidden to use footnotes prologues no it, they insisted that all had to be contained in the, the tr translated poem itself. But with time, we felt that this is another rule we want to start disobeying because we feel that the uh, decisions, the discussions, the problems are central to understanding what happened with the translation. Uh, do you keep track of, 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 of these uh, conversations you have with your translators uh, regarding different uh, decisions you, you take? Uh, sometimes I do. Um, my life is so busy that I can't keep uh, up yes. with uh, because there's different uh, Cree language groups going on on Zoom and I can't um, uh, be on Zoom all the time to participate. But um, we keep track of each other uh, by phone or when we're getting together and we have good laughs over uh, uh, the thoughts of translating a, a particular word. And sometimes I do write it and uh, try, try to keep track of it, but it's very, <laughs> it's very fluid and hard to do. So, um, but Jean and, and uh, Eric are, are much more involved in that community right across the province and um, yeah, it's going on. And if I want access to it, all I need to do is reach out and, and uh, give them a call. And yeah, so I have to run up and go get a copy of um, Awasa's. I don't have it in sitting in front of me. So if you'll excuse me for one second. Yes, of course, yeah. Um, perhaps w we could just tell Alaina that Uh, one of our younger colleagues, um, but I, she hasn't been able to, to connect uh, now, um, lives in Oaxaca and uh, her language is Zapoteco. And we were wondering about, um, now we finished translating the uh, storyteller into Spanish and perhaps again, not forgetting our doubts or problems, but then we thought that we could um, see about putting, get, with um, our Eileen, our colleague in uh, Oaxaca, translating it into Zapoteco, but once again, um, seeing I mean, is there the is there a word for storyteller in Zapoteco, uh, or is there something interesting there? What about gender? No, uh, does this exist or not like that? And that would uh, teach us in Mexico. All of us who do not know Zapoteco would learn a lot, and also uh, the links in the chain that Luis's work 
detonates, no, would uh, carry on to a next moment. I, I think that would be an incredible next step in the, in the whole exploration. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yep, we'll, we'll work on it and keep in touch. And again, even if it's not the 50 poems, but uh, we could start off choosing some for uh, the, the next moment. Great. Bueno, so fine. Um, will you then uh, um, sh share, will you read to us, uh, Luis, the storyteller, uh, <laughs> you, you as storyteller, will you tell us this story then uh, as a treat? <laughs> okay, I'll be happy to. Utatsumu, the storyteller. My brother, Skinny Weasel, and my other brother, Short Tail Octopus, always said I was the ugly one. But you decide. My nose has mongols from a black diamond ski hill, a moose nose. My floppy ears whip back when I hear a juicy Atsumunis. Awasis chose me, me to share these droll adventures. He, she is a she, he who loves a slippery, stretchy yarn. I like the way Awasis Atsumonis darts up and down my bones through my big belly and arrows into my heart. Awasis, Awasis, I've heard the settler is confused about your shape-shifting. You can't decide if you're an animal or a human, if you are a he or a she. I am your Wakumanis, Wakumanis, Oasis. Like her cousin Wisaketsa was a shapeshifter, a coyote, a raven, a fox, a crow, a weasel. I just knew she was fascinating. Nikawiwak used to say, Gayas, our people spoke with all creation, and creation understood each other. The Atayuganak say animals and humans shapeshifted. Oasis is a rubber lip mouth, an obnoxious mouse, somersaulting thunder, a seductive breeze whispering into my hearing aid. She's hidden her laughter under my travel-worn feet, blended into my sagging, wrinkled skin. The owl wisdom of her face is the skylight of my dreams. Hi, hi. Thank you for listening. Gracias. Gracias. Muchas gracias. Okay. <laughs> I think you should uh, read it in Spanish, Claudia. No, 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 no. The the, the Louise's um, voice is what I think should close next time when we've translated it all uh, and practiced. We read it in Spanish, but today I think the sound we should take home in our hearts is is Louise, the storyteller, um, whom we thank you and Alaina for um, being willing to, to, to share this um, morning. And um, our idea is we're going to finish translating the, the poem. We'll keep in touch. We're going to see if we can translate into Zapoteco with Eileen. And um, once we've done our, our homework, we Keep in touch because um, we feel this is um, something that really matters. Bien, pues. Thank you so much for uh, organizing all of this uh, exchange. <laughs>
I, it's so important that we have it all over the world. And uh, so I'm really appreciative that you've come abro abroad, abroad or aboard. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Both. <laughs> I'll do something. <laughs> it was such a pleasure. And uh, so you'll have to teach me how to speak a few words in Spanish. So when I go to Mexico, I won't get lost. <laughs> please, <laughs> Thank please you. With, with pleasure. Um, we will do that. Um, and yes, the UNAM is, uh, as I say in Mexico, this is a nice saying, uh, our house is your house. So Mexico uh, and UNAM is su casa. And uh, hopefully we will get together here in, in persona at some point. Bueno, pues... Thank you once again. We'll keep in touch. Take care. Cuídense. And uh, thank you once again.